Can you see me yet? Check. Let me check my page. No. No. You are live. It says I'm live. It says I'm building an audience. From your personal page. Personal page. That's okay, correct. Okay. Now I'm not can see you. You can. Now we can see you. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So now I need you to put your video back up so that everybody can join us. All right. I don't, I'm not. I'm not. You're receiving wait, your video wait. yet. I'm not receiving Do some introduction. I'm here. Okay, I'm here. no problem. I need to receive your business. Yes, I can see you now. Perfect. This is Dr. Brent Turvey, and I am here live again uh, with Dr. Are with, with uh, soon to be Dr. Aurelio Coronado of Aguas Calientes, Mexico. Uh, both of us have been working very hard all weekend, and neither one of us has had a lot of sleep because we've once again overcommitted to our time. <laughs> And I understand that Aurelio spent yeah, this morning. <laughs> okay, do you have? Can I get your video, my friend? Everybody wants to see your face to make sure we're not just making up your presence once again. I see nothing. I mean, I'm there. Can you see me? No, I can't. I see. Can you see me? I see nothing. You? Oh yeah. Well. Oh. Ho, ho. Bobby, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I can hear you great. Uh, but I need your video. I well, need... I will try. What happened? I lost you. Oh my goodness. Oh. Close. We have to receive. Aurelia, there we go. We lost him there for a second, but we're getting him back. All right, my friend, there you are. Yeah. Now, what ha this, did you hang up on me? Is that what you did? No, it's no, just no. Uh, disconnect because sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. Okay. Yeah. So tell me. Tell me, you spent uh, this morning talking to prosecutors, uh, talk, no, excuse me, talking to the media, right? Yeah, we give a uh, press conference about the resignation of the prosecutor here in Aguascalientes. And we have a problem with that because he's not following properly all his cases. So oh. uh, we need to pressure so we can have a new prosecutor that... Uh, understand that job and make proper uh, protocols so they so the investigation right. investigation investigator I mean can follow up right this is the problem people always wonder why I'm willing to participate in the media and use the media to apply pressure for certain things and the reason why is because it's often the only thing that works we talked about this this weekend we're writing a chapter on lies and perception and talk to me about that. That's a real, the real problem with government functionaries is a lot of them try to appear to be doing work when they're not actually doing work, right? So, yes, we've been discussing that subject for the last week. It's very hard to people who are not involved in this field to understand that it's very different to look like you're doing your work and actually doing the work. And we are, we, are, we are trying to build an agenda where people like that can be uh, transparent and, right. and other people can see if actually they are doing what they're supposed to do in like following protocols and, right. and, and professional standards. Right. If, if, uh, if everybody was professional and everyone was well-educated, then we wouldn't need protocols because we'd all, we'd all know what they were. <laughs> The reason that we have protocols and that we have ethical standards is to help us to identify and then either educate or expel people who are fraudulent or incompetent. Would that, would that seem correct? Yeah, that's right. So that's, <laughs> what, what, that's one of the objectives of this morning press conference. And it's, it sounds like such an easy thing. Like, oh, we'll just make sure everybody's educated and competent. And the reason it sounds easy is because the public thinks that it's true, that it's uh, that that's something everybody's educated, everybody's competent, or they wouldn't be working in the profession, correct? Yes, that, that's a common idea, but that's mostly, that's very frequent and um, uh, false idea. Yeah, most of the people who are actually working in these professions, whether it's criminology, forensic science, forensic psychology, these are people who are actually very poorly educated, educated by people who know less than they do, and don't actually know the job that they're supposed to be doing. And so a lot of them spend a lot of their time either faking the job or trying to appear as though they're doing something constructive when they're actually doing nothing at all. They're just mimicking what they see on TV. And that brings us yeah. to the subject of our lecture today, correct? Exactly. So 
We're going to be talking. Tell us about the conference that's upcoming that you and I are going to be attending. Well, to everyone in Mexico, let me talk a little bit in Spanish. What? No, come on. Yes. Tienes que aprender español. Tienes que aprender español. No comprende. En abril, el 27 de abril, va a haber una conferencia, va a haber un congreso de CNI. Ustedes saben que CNI es una institución muy importante en nuestro país que hace eventos y que tiene diferentes actividades académicas alrededor de la psicología. El doctor Brent Truby eh, estará ahí dando una conferencia acerca de criminal psychology. Y yo voy a estar ahí hablando acerca de la eh, acreditación en el sistema acusatorio de eh, peritos expertos en psicología o testigos expertos en psicología. So, Brent, uh, you're going to talk about uh, criminal psychology. That's What's going to be the general subject of that? Well, the general subject of that is going to be what is criminal psychology in the face of this overwhelming media agenda to present it as one way versus professionals who are trying to learn it in the real world. It, yeah. On TV and in film, for example, we're constantly confronted with images of, of uh, very emotionally damaged individuals who are dark and brooding, who are communicating almost directly and constantly with the criminals that they're trying to yes. apprehend. And this is a completely, not only false image, but it's deeply unprofessional. The uh, psychologists, for example, who work in the treatment realm, they're normally um, engaging in subjective analysis where they sit down and talk with somebody one-to-one -one and they build a fictional narrative and they treat people based on that. They're trying to help them. And so they're not confronting them or, or, uh, or doubting them. They're just learning and talking and trying to help them. And that's the narrative that most psychologists come from. The forensic psychological world and the criminal psychological world comes from the evaluation of indirect evidence crime scene photographs, uh, modus operandi behavior, victimology, indirect physical evidence, indirect behavioral evidence that you use to help understand the offender. And almost never are you speaking directly with or communicating in any way with the offender. That is not that's a construct of the media and of, <laughs> and of true crime and of, uh, of dramatized events of films and television in order to create drama. But the reality is real people don't behave that way. The problem that we have over and over again is an overwhelming number of people who work in the profession think that that's how it works. Think that yeah. the media image of criminal profiling, criminal psychology, forensic psychology is, is the real image. So they spend more time trying to appear as though they're living up to that image than actually doing the work. And in fact, they don't even really know what the work is. So that, yeah. that's the, we're combating, we're going to try to combat that. Yeah, and, the, and I think one of the most uh, interesting thing to me is like the real forensic psychology or the real criminal psychology is more uh, is more interesting yes. than what you see in TV. Oh, that's so true. What you see on film and television lacks depth, character, and even uh, realistic uh, scenarios. The real life yeah. scenarios that you encounter are extremely complex. They're extremely emo they're emotional. Uh, they have a lot of players, and there's a lot of uh, subtlety, a lot of subtlety of and course. nuance in the behavior that you have to examine. And there's also a ton of documentation, whether it be from their social media accounts, their text messages that go back and forth, photographs they send each other, uh, telephone conversations, uh, conversations they have with people at work versus conversations they have at home. Um, all these things. And then also their, their hidden life, the life that they don't show to the rest of the world. All these things you're considering and examining, and that kind of stuff almost never gets portrayed accurately in films and television because the people who write these fictional narratives, they have no idea what they're talking about. They've never actually worked a real case. They've never had to deal with emotional complexity. And they also, and let's be fair, I think they underestimate and they, they, the intelligence of their audience. They, they, they speak to an yes. audience that's extremely unsophisticated and willing to buy into that. Get respond to that a little bit. Yeah, that's why you need these uh, fantasy techniques right. that they show. <laughs> like, fantasy, I like that. Uh, having really these like, uh, um, paranormal, paranormal oh. intelligence that oh, God, they can yes. see inside of the mind of the criminal. Right. Or they can see all the lies because they can see nonverbal right. behavior. Because it's easier to tell a story in a movie right. 
using that superpower. Right. So it's like they're like a superhero of, instead of like a human being. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, is is you know is if not the story is gonna last like three hours <laughs> right. doing an interview. So right. or or applying or doing research. Right. Right. So I think uh, we are confusing exactly. That's the pro we are confusing both universes. Yeah. One is for entertaining. One yes. is the real world. But the problem, and I think you picture you you are giving a real interesting picture is like real professional are mimic television. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Look, look, really unreal. I want to I want to give an example. Uh, for example, you'll see where well, there was a case of a gentleman who was committing forensic fraud uh, as a crime scene investigator for many years, like almost uh, over two decades. And he would often show up with his FBI uh, crime scene unit uh, shirt on. Yeah, oh, not shirt, excuse me, a jacket. <laughs> FBI crime scene unit wearing the jacket, wearing all the gear. They have all the gear, all the equipment. And they're always showing up with that. And people think, oh, that means he's competent and skilled. The guy had no education, no background. It took years to figure out he was just plain stupid. He was a dumb person pretending based on what he'd seen on TV. It took years to figure it out because not only... Not only do um, people who are ignorant mimic these behaviors in order to appear legitimate, real professionals who don't know the job, they think it's real too. That's the problem. The, the real professionals who are not directly involved in the work think it's real as well. So everyone is bought into this and invested in this phony media persona. I'm not unlike, say, polygraph examination. Polygraph examinations don't work. They're not a real thing. They're a phony trick used by uneducated law enforcement to trick even less educated criminals or less sophisticated criminals into making inculpatory statements. But as a scientific instrument, they don't work at all. Everyone knows this, yeah. but everyone is so heavily invested in it that they're unwilling to let it go. They're, they're, and you know, more importantly, they're eager to play up to the phony image for their own advantage. Yeah. It, so that's why I think it's very important, uh, this work that right. uh, you are doing, writing this book, that's coming uh, maybe this year. <laughs> well, about there's, false allegations. There's two books that we've that we, you and I you and I have partnered on. Um, well, you've contributed a chapter to our upcoming book. It's going to be out in uh, next week, uh, called yes. Forensic Investigations. Dr. Strand Crowder and I uh, co-authored that textbook, and you're one of the contributors to it. Um, yeah. So that's one of the textbooks, and that addresses the strengths and limitations of forensic investigation techniques in the very real world of forensic science and crime scene investigation as opposed to the phony, dramatized world from film and television. The other textbook that we're working on, you and I are currently co-editing with Detective John Savino of the Manhattan Special Victim Squad, retired, uh, is False Allegations. And this has, false to do, allegations. this has to do essentially with false allegations of crimes in multiple contexts. And this is where your background in the psychology of lies has played a very powerful role in uh, making us more informed about what lies are, what context they're told in, the relationship that you have to develop with someone in order to lie and to deceive someone and be deceived. It's a very uh, complex and nuanced conversation that hasn't really been had yet, nor has it been applied in a criminal context very well. So I'm very, I'm very excited to be working on these projects with you this year. Both of them should be out this. Uh, the first one's going to be out next week. The next one should be out by the yes. end of the year. Well, I think both, and, I'm, and, and, and I think the audience needs to, to think these books as a, a, a very, um, they're the product of a very long job, very okay. long uh, work, and they're supposed to say, okay, this is the state of play, right. this is the state of art in forensic uh, sciences, That's right. this, is a, this is the state of play in false allegations, right? They don't. They need to understand that this is the product of a long uh, time doing research, hand, having conversations, yep. and treating real casework. And I'm very excited to to you know to right. share this with the audience. And I hope we are having those in Spanish real soon. All right. Well, that's up. That's not up to me. <laughs> Well, I know. <laughs> uh, because no, uh, I don't know I don't know if you're aware of this and this is something that maybe you and I haven't discussed enough but I don't speak Spanish very well. And well, I speak English like you speak 
Um, English? I don't know. English? Chinese or whatever. <laughs> <So> <laughs> hey! We're trying, we're, that, we're we're trying exactly. to build a bridge. Right exactly, now. exactly. We're trying to build but, uh, uh, communication. So one, one of the things. This is Spanglish. Exactly right. Now, one of the things that I want to leave uh, viewers with is the notion that. There is a scientific basis for all these things. There are scientific protocols in place for all these things, for, uh, for forensic investigation and for uh, uh, the psychology of lies. All the research is there, yeah. but it's done by actual scientists. And the problem is there's very few people who are applying that to casework. And you and I happen to work with colleagues like Michael McGrath, Sean Michelet, Stan Crowder, uh, John Savino, who are at the forefront of applying these techniques and their scientific basis to criminal casework, either in investigations or in court, uh, in court cases. And that's, that's very few people who actually understand the science and are applying it in the forensic realm. Tell me about just a little bit about that. That's another big Well, problem. that's exactly, that's the, that's the situation. We have a lot of, uh, not books, but actual a lot of information in social media yep. about how to uh, find out if someone is lying. Right. And, that's actually not the work. No. If you are working real cases, it's not about to catch for non-verbal right. uh, investigation if someone is lying. You do basically a research right. and you compare the narrative versus the evidence. The evidence. Yeah, the, and and, and by evidence, we don't mean... Like yeah, but by evidence, and lawyers will hear evidence and they'll hear testimony. No. When we talk about evidence, no. we're talking about physical behaviorance, a victimological background and behavioral evidence exhibited by the actual offender and the objective record of the case, not based on whether they can get somebody else to agree with them and not based on other subjective uh, forms of evidence. Yeah. Well, are you excited to come to Mexico right now? I am. I, I have not been back to Mexico in a few months. Again, we're going to Tepic and Nayarit. And what are the dates, please? It's uh, uh, 27 of April. 27th of April. That seems like a really long time away. Yeah, well, it's like a one, two months two from months. now. You can count. It's two months. <laughs> two months. It's too, it's too hard. Because, it's too, you know, <laughs> exactly. It's too, too, too hard. All right, my friend, is there any parting thoughts you'd like to leave the group with before we uh, head our separate ways for the day? No, just remember the people. Uh, 27 de April. Tendremos un congreso en Tepic, Nayarit, para que estén al pendientes. Vamos a dejar el link. We're going to leave the link of the events. That's right. So now, what, can, what is the group? What they, group What oh, group is uh, sponsoring this event? What an excellent group are we working with? CENEIP. What is CENEIP? CENEIP? Tell me what CENEIP is real quick for my American well, viewers. This, this is a, a very big and important organization related to academic, um, um, academic work in psychology. They work, okay. they have a long... They, they, they are very uh, involved in all the for, all the formation of psychologists in universities, and they have this big uh, event each year. Right. So you and me are very lucky to be there all right. uh, this year. Well, I'm honored. So I look forward to seeing you there, and I'll talk to you again probably next week. All right, Aurelio? Yeah, man. We'll see you next week. Okay. Talk to you later, brother. We'll see you. See ya.